Welcome to Web Chat Wednesdays. I'm Artie and I'm here with Chris. Hello everyone, how are you doing? Today we're interviewing Jeremy Schott, owner of the Dark Arts Emporium in Long Beach, California. What is the Dark Arts Emporium? The Dark Art Emporium is a art gallery slash oddity shop in downtown Long Beach. And um, we showcase lowbrow art, dark art, uh, human, only place in Long Beach you can buy a human skull, um, human remains, uh, weird books, all kinds of cool stuff. That's awesome. And how did the original concept for the Dark Arts Emporium come about? Um, well, I was a cameraman for heavy metal bands and pro wrestling and that sort of thing, corporate videos and all that stuff. And about five years ago, I got tired of living on the road. Um, it's a lot of fun in your like 20s. And then as you get older, it's not so fun anymore. So while we were on the road, I would always look at like, well, where's the weird museum, uh, the oddity shop? Like, what can I go see? The roadside attractions, that sort of thing. And then the lead singer of the band I was with, Eddie um, from Suicide Silence, he was like, dude, you're just like into art in general, like anything, whether it's music, you know, books, uh, paintings, whatever it is, you're just into it. So that kind of gave me the idea of like, oh, well, I should just do this myself. Um, and then just ran with it. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, well, so was there a particular moment or experience like that kind of, I know you said just the whole traveling on, down the road and like seeing other places, like, is there a specific place that you maybe want to shout out? Oh man, I love, I love, I love all kinds of, all the places, um, you know, like Sweden and uh, Norway and Finland, all the Scandinavian countries were awesome. Um, you know, Germany is a great, great country. Um, Australia was a lot of fun. Thailand. Um, all of Southeast Asia was really cool. I mean, I've been around the world twice, um, so it was really cool. Did any of those places have like a specific oddity shop that kind of like uh, maybe inspired you? Well, in New York, there was a place called Obscura. Uh, you might remember it. There was on, they had made a TV show about them um, on Discovery Channel, I think, called, I think it was called Obscura or something like that, or Oddities or something like that. So that place was really cool. Um, but outside of that, like, you know, there's like the catacombs and uh, all, all throughout Europe, you can go down there and look at dead, dead monks and yeah. um, that was really cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, what sparked me to really just do this is I was doing a corporate gig for a laundry coin operated laundry conference in Ojai. And, you know, I'm sitting in this big conference hall and guys are talking about like, laundry machines and I'm sitting with my like you know twenty thousand dollar camera and a suit getting paid a lot of money but it was soulless so I decided I wanted to do something that actually mattered with the world and so that was the idea of the of a gallery like give people a voice that I I like and hopefully people other other people like it too that's awesome yeah thanks thanks for that that's uh that's some great insight Jeremy um so over time, Dark Arts Emporium, you know, has seen a few different, you know, incarnations and spaces. Can you take us through the history of the space and how it has evolved, you know, from where it used to be and where it is now? Sure. So the first time I opened, I guess it was like four and a half years ago or so, we were on Elm Street or Elm Avenue um, and Third, and it was a tiny little 600 square foot boutique. Um, with concrete walls. I had to drill every time I needed to hang an art piece. Um, and it was tiny. And I was there for six months. And then there was a place on the corner that was supposed to be a tattoo parlor and they couldn't get their permits. Um, so I mentioned to the landlady that, you know, if that ever opened up when my lease was over, I'd like to move there. Um, and then six months down the road, after I just built out the whole gallery, she's like, hey, you want to do it now? Um, so double the rent. Um, double the space and uh, it was a big risk. And this, so I built that out again and then moved two doors down. And then I think we were there for two and a half or three years. Um, and that's kind of where we started to grow. We became kind of a hub for the uh, Long Beach Art Walk. Um, and we were right across the street from the Long Beach Art Museum's annex. Um, and that worked out really well because um, everybody that was 
into art at the time was kind of coming in that space. Um, and we were throwing like really cool art shows. Um, I guess to take it back is that um, I met my partner here, Jeremy Cross, the other Jeremy um, at the old space and he was curating at other galleries um, and he was a local artist. So he came in and helped me and kind of helped taught me how to hang an art show, really. I had no clue what I was doing um, before this. I'd worked like a toy store when I was in high school. I knew nothing about retail. I was film, I studied film. Like, I don't know anything about any of this. So he really helped me out and helped the gallery grow a lot. And so from that, and now we're in behind the Fourth Horseman. So two years ago, um, I met Martin and Ryan, my business partners at the Fourth Horseman, and they were at Phantom Carriage Brewery in, I think it's Carson. And it was like a horror themed brewery. And so I became buddies with them and they started sponsoring art shows. And then they came to me with the idea of the Fourth Horseman, which I thought was a really fun, cool idea. So we did that. And then when the space behind the Fourth Horseman opened up, um, the landlord approached me and asked me if I was interested in it. And so we made basically a speakeasy art gallery behind the pizza place, um, which has been open to the public officially one day. <laughs> so not too many people have been back here unless you've made an appointment to come see it. Yeah, I've been to the first, well, not the first one. I've been, I've been to the Dark Arts Emporium when it was on Elm Street, but I haven't got to check out the new one, obviously, because it just opened, but I'm really eager to check it out and go get a slice of pizza from the fourth horseman. Yeah, well, it, it, it was, I mean, the, we did our one opening here, March 15th of last year with May Mora from Japan. And then the very next day was the lockdown. So we were here for one day and not having street access and all that stuff. I was kind of worried that this wouldn't work, um, but we survived COVID. So um, I think once we can start getting people back into the pizza place again and start having art openings again, um, it'll start getting a little bit more normal, I guess. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if it works. We still, you never know. It's an art gallery. <laughs> since you, uh, since you partnered with uh, the fourth horseman, do you have a favorite type of pizza? Um, I'm pretty simple. I'm just a pepperoni and jalapeno dude. Um, that's my favorite pizza. That's my go-to. Maybe throw mushrooms on to be fancy, but, uh, lately we've been having the spicy vegan, um, uh, what is it, this spicy vegan mar margarita and adding pepperonis to it. And that thing is awesome. Um, so that's kind of been my new favorite right now. So to bring it back to the, uh, to the Emporium, uh, what, energy, what energy or feeling do you want people to experience when they enter the Dark Arts Emporium? Um, I want people to feel like when you walk in here, like as an artist, I want you to feel safe and be able to ex um, you know, express yourself in any way you want. I want people to be welcoming and welcomed here. Um, and, you know, I know what we show and what we do isn't exactly for everyone. Um, but I also have a feeling that if you spend enough time in here and look at the walls, you're going to find something that you like, maybe not you want to put in your home, but something that, you know, you're going to be like, wow, that's really cool. I never expected to walk into this place and find something that interests me. Um, so that's, uh, I guess that's my goal is to, you know, make dark art and lowbrow art more mainstream. I know lowbrow kind of had its heyday, but I think dark art is kind of up and coming right now and it's only going to get bigger and better. Um, and people will start accepting it as more of a, as a, as a, as a mainstream media, as opposed to like, you know, comic book stuff and, you know, band band covers and stuff like that you know yeah. do, you, do you have a process for setting up an art show I know you said you learned a lot from your partner your other friend Jeremy but do you have your own process for just like setting up an art show like curating all the pieces because sometimes I, you have multiple artists and then sometimes I imagine you maybe have just like solo shows perhaps yeah so um when it comes to like an artist like we do accept submissions, but a lot of the art I seek out myself and so does Cross. Um, and then like with the group shows, like it's usually just kind of like an idea, like this month is called Feral. 
Um, and it was just, you know, I thought it was a cool title for an art show. And then, you know, you look up the definition of feral and then what that means. And then you send the prompt to the artist and say, I don't like to tell people what to paint, um, but you kind of give them like a, you know, a, a, you know, a, just a little prompt to make them think about, well, what does the word feral mean to me? And then, you know, they go from there. Um, so that's kind of how we do the group shows is usually just kind of like a theme or an idea. Um, and then, as, and then the solo shows, like I tell the artists that these are their walls for that month. So it's pretty much whatever they want to do. Um, granted, I'll give, you know, if they ask for advice or, you know, uh, comments or anything, I will. But for the most part, this, this space is theirs for a month. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. The, the first time I ever went to the Dark Arts Emporium was during an art walk. And I was like really amazed because maybe a few years before that I had seen, I had heard about like, I think it's Greg Allman. He released an album called Southern Blood and the album cover was painted in blood. And it has this like really like orangey rusty tint to the album cover. I think he might've even used his own blood for it. And then, and then when I went in there, I think, I think the artist, it was like a solo show for the artist who did the album cover for, for Southern Blood. Yep. Yeah, that was Vincent Castigula. Um, he was a big get, like when I opened this place, I was a big fan of his work and never thought that he would ever give me any attention. Like, I mean, his first, that uh, Vincent's first solo show was at the Giger Museum in Switzerland when he was, I think, 19 years old. Um, Giger was a mentor to him. Um, he's a badass, Giger? badass tattoo artist. Yeah, H.R. Giger. That's a, that was his mentor. That's so freaking amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vincent was buddies with him, um, and so when we approached him, I was talking. We were actually uh, Cross and I were hanging an art show, and I just mentioned like, "Man, I'd love to get Castigula in here." And he was like, "I know him. I have his phone number." Um, <laughs> and so they'd met years ago in the past, and. Um, so you asked him if you'd want to do a solo show and he said yes. And that Greg Allman piece you're talking about um, was painted in Greg and his children's blood. Um, it's owned by his daughter, um, Brooklyn, um, who was at the show. It was really cool to meet her. Um, but when that painting showed up in a crate, I remember opening it and like, oh my God, like I'm holding, I'm holding Greg Allman. Like his DNA is right here. Um, it's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, Vincent only paints in human blood. Um, he uses it like a watercolor um, and he's fantastic. That's awesome. And I've become, you know, it was really cool as I've become really good friends with him. Like we, we talk like once a month. Yeah, that's such a great story. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I did not know that. That's a, that's a, that's a pretty amazing unexpected connection too, especially just because you're doing something that you're passionate about and these unexpected connections just formulate and happen just because you're doing what you, you know, what, what you, what you love or what you care about, or, you know, just doing something you're really into. So I guess aside from like some of those connections, what is your favorite thing about, or one of the favorite things that you, uh, about what you do? Actually, the other day I sold a painting to a student and it was his very first original piece he'd ever bought. And when that happens, that's really exciting to me. Um, when I'm turning somebody on to something new, it was a Vince Locke, um, which he came in because he was a fan of Vince Locke and his comic books and the Cannibal Corpse covers and stuff like that. And he wanted one off the walls that was cheaper. And uh, I told, I was, had a dot on it, it was already sold. And I was like, but you can have this one. He's like, oh, but it's more expensive. So I gave him a discount. And then he told me it was his first original. And I'm, Felt so good, like um, he was really excited about it. And you know, with this place and this type of art gallery, people aren't buying it because of resale value or you know, I'm a, it's an investment piece and stuff like that. Like people buy this stuff because it speaks to them and they love it. And so that's that's the most rewarding part of it is you know, is that people are buying these things because they want to look at it every day. Um, the same way I got into art and the same way, you know, I got into collecting art. I mean, I was a collector before this place. So. Do you remember your first piece of original art? Hmm. Um, hmm. 
it might have been a big tasty or Matthew Levin. Um, I used to go to Hyena Gallery. Actually, Bill is kind of a mentor to me with the gallery. Um, Hyena Gallery in Burbank. I buy. I used to buy a lot of artwork from him. Um, and so when I opened this place, you know, I told him what I was doing, and he was like, uh, "You don't want to do this." <laughs> but I did it anyways. And uh, so, like, is stupid things like asking how do I write an artist contract. Um, he kind of held my hand with that. Um, so it was definitely an art piece from Bill. I can't remember. It was either, I think it was the Big Tasty. There's a, it's actually a paint. It's a drawing of this woman with a glass of wine in her hand, looking at like a drawing of boobs and a drawing of a penis and vagina. And it's just a little blob that comes out of her head. Man, this art shit sure is weird. <laughs> I think it's that one. That might be my first one. That's awesome. I'm curious, how did you, uh, how did you make your way to Long Beach? You said you were from Houston, right? So how, yeah. did you, how did you end up in Long Beach? Did you move other places before you landed here or did you come straight to Long Beach? I, uh, I grew up in Houston and then when I, and then I moved to Austin, Texas and was enrolled at UT for film, but I never went. Um, I was working at a place called I Love Video. It was like an underground video store and we were open till 3 a.m. So working till 3 a.m. getting drunk and then showing up to class at 8 a.m. just didn't work out. <laughs> so dropped out of there. And then I was going to move to the Cayman Islands with a friend to become a bartender or go to Chapman Film School. And um, my girlfriend at the time wrote an entrance uh, essay for Chapman. And unfortunately, I got in and didn't get to go to the Bahamas or the Cayman Islands, um, which actually worked out because then my buddy, he got wiped out by a hurricane. Now he's living in Houston. Oh, wow. um, so definitely like, you know, I just kind of like show up places and fall into things. Um, so I went to Chapman Film School and then I had a friend that grew up in Long Beach and he, I can never live in Hollywood. Um, I just can't do LA. It's too much. And so I visited Long Beach and kind of fell in love with it. And you can come here and not listen to some guy pitch a script behind you at a coffee shop. And the like, real people live here. Um, so I'd make the drive anytime I needed to go to Hollywood for work. Um, but I love it here. Yeah. I live, my first apartment actually, a block from where we are, the Horseman, 16, 17 years ago. So. Oh, wow. And uh, wh why do you think Long Beach is a good place for the Emporium? um i don't know if it is <laughs> um actually like long beach long beach is weird uh long beach is cool like there's some yeah, long beach actually kind of reminds me a bit of like austin because it's a big city but it's very small too like everybody kind of knows each other um but there's so many people here i don't know how that's possible but everybody kind of runs in these worlds where everybody kind of knows each other um and I was very surprised that the, the dark art was so welcoming here because I was, you know, when we first opened, I was putting signs outside that said Thomas Kincaid sucks by real art. Um, and I expected backlash, but people came in and they, they're like, oh, this is really cool. But anyways, so yeah, I don't know. Long Beach, I lived here and I wasn't going to do it anywhere else if I was going to do it pretty much is what it comes down to. If it didn't work within a year, I was gonna say screw it and figure something else out. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool that you have such like a durable and adventurous personality. I feel like a lot of people kind of crumble when it comes to like adversity. You know, it's hard. Reality's hard, and but it's cool that you turned it into, you know, the fact that you started the Dark Arts Emporium with no knowledge of throwing an art show and whatnot. Like, it's really inspirational. That's kind of what we want to do is just like inspire the people who watch this to take on, you know, go through their own journey and adventure. Yeah, I mean, when I was at Chapman Film School, I had a, um, a directing teacher that probably gave me the best, like I went to college off and on for like seven years, um, but she gave me the best advice and she said, you're scared to fail, don't be scared to fail. Um, and then, you know, like that's, that was a big thing that stuck with me is that you're going to fall on your face over and over and over again. 
but eventually something's going to work that's going to make sense to you or other people. So um, anytime somebody asks me about starting a business or doing anything really is like, do it. Like you only get one, one time around this world, like, you know, give it a shot. Definitely. Awesome. Um, seems like you, uh, you speak highly of the city of Long Beach and uh, you recognize that there's like some weirdness to it and a little something for everyone. Uh, what are some of your favorite spots around Long Beach? Um, I love the Prospector. I think the Prospector is a fine establishment that um, needs to be around here forever and ever and ever. Um, Alex's bar is great and I become good buddies with Alex throughout the years and that place is awesome and I hope it keeps going forever and ever and ever. Like having that in our backyard with that quality of music and and shows and stuff is is amazing um i don't want to leave long beach if i don't have to to go see a concert um i'm trying to think of other places that i really like i, t I take walks to the queen mary all the time um, um a couple other you know hops and vines my old neighbors that place is fantastic great beer selection um, and good people. So yeah, I mean, I guess that's, I don't know. I like, I like all the places. Old Dubliner is awesome. And you know, Old Dubliner is great and Ordinary is great too. And Lola's has great food and Super Mex and Cinco de Mayo right here has some of the best Mexican food in Long Beach too. Then nobody ever goes there. Um, I hope they keep going forever too. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we try to put together a, like a list of book recommendations from all of our guests. So do you have any books or even any like media films or art that you'd want to oh. recommend to our patrons? Yeah, I had to, I had to write them down because I forget um, titles. So when people ask me like what books to read, um, but anything by Bukowski, um, I love all of his books and poetry. And then Jerry Stahl is a really good writer that I really like, like Plain Clothes Naked and Perv a Love Story are awesome. And then I'm really into John Ronson books. Um, he did a book called Them, Adventures with Extremists that is fantastic. I don't, I don't believe in conspiracy theories, but I really like to read about them and like, they really interest me. So that one's really fun. Um, and then Doug Stanhope, the comedian, one of my favorite comedians wrote a book called Digging Up Mother about him helping his mother die, um, which is a beautiful book and extremely funny. Um, and then Back to Trauma, Make Your Own Damn Movie by Lloyd Kaufman is extremely inspiring. Is that like a documentary? I haven't heard of that one. Um, he, it's a book slash DVD set. And um, he wrote a book with, I can't remember the guy's name, but the guy that does Guardians of the Galaxy and like the Marvel movies now started at Troma. So there's another book called mm -hmm. All Everything I Learned About Filmmaking I Learned from Toxic Avenger. And they co-wrote that. And then Lloyd has this other, it's like, here's how you do things. Um, and then what else did I write down? Uh, it was one more. Oh, I'm not a cop by Richard Bel Belzner. Um, he's an actor and he always gets, you know, he plays cops in all the movies. So people think he's a real cop. And the book is really funny because it's like semi autobiographical, but you know, nonfiction at the same time and fictional at the same time. And it's really weird and really into that. And then my desk, I have it. I must have taken it home. I always keep a, I have a copy about how to run an art gallery. <laughs> oh, I don't even know who's by or anything, but I bought that day one when I opened this place. So every time you get into a situation, you just open up your desk and just go to find the page <laughs> yeah. that's relevant. Yeah, most of it's not relevant at all because it's for like blue chip galleries, but oh. um, every now and then and it said stick to what you want to do. And that's what I've been doing. As movies go, like Fitzcarraldo's one of my favorite book or movies, and by Werner Herzog. I mean, 
he pulled a opera boat over a mountain in real life for that movie. Um, and that movie's awesome. And then, you know, Night of the Hunter is a great one too. Cool. Well, we will gather that list and hope to see what's in our collection and make it as easy as possible for our patrons to check those books out. Yeah. Hopefully you have them. I'm sure we have a, a good portion of the books, but we'll see. Yeah. I used to, I used to own that book about how to run an art gallery. I, I picked it up at a used bookstore and um, as I was thrumming, thumbing through it, I flipped to the back. Uh, it was a, it was a hardbound copy. And I flipped to the back and there was an old $2 bill just tucked away inside the, the protective sleeve in the back. And I always just left it in there because I felt like it was a lucky $2 bill. But yeah, that was a great read. I remember just, you know, nerding out on how galleries are run because I enjoy art galleries. And I always just wondered, well, what, like what goes into, you know, making the gallery happen? I think I picked it up for like a dollar or two dollars, which was like a great deal, but definitely a wealth of knowledge in that book. Yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely helpful, like, you know, and coming up with a name and, you know, learning that you need to stick to what you want to do, you know, don't show, you know, street art and graffiti stuff. And then the next day show dark art, like stick with what you know, and what you're passionate about, as opposed to what will sell. Um, it was pretty much the main thing I took from that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so as you know, we were uh, a department in the in the public library system, and so we asked all of our guests, uh, "What is one of the most memorable experiences you've had in a library, any type of library, huh. whether that it's was... college or public?" Let's see. Um, I, I'm I'm bad. I don't go to the library <laughs> that often. Um, even in college, like I, you know, I'd go when I had to, but it wasn't. Um, too memorable. It was just writing a paper and needing to find things. Uh, esoteric um, libraries also count. There's a few of those in LA. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the Long Beach library that just, they just finished is gorgeous. Like I've probably been in there. I've been in there way more times than the old library. I don't think I ever darkened the doors of the old library. The new library is gorgeous. Like I kind of, I want to go spend more time there, but damn COVID. Um, I can't do it right now, um, but I think I know the Long Beach uh, Long Beach Library will definitely. If I, I don't have any memories yet, but I probably will soon. Yeah, thank you for giving us all of your time. We appreciate it so much. And where can people find out more about the Dark Arts Emporium? Just go to darkartemporium.com. Um, everything's there. Uh, our Instagram, our Facebook. Um, we update that pretty regularly. Um, and if you're in the, in the town right now, we're doing appointments. I'm thinking probably next month we'll stop doing appointments on Fridays and Saturdays and I'll just sit here and you can come see me. Um, but right now we're just doing appointments just cause the world's weird. Um, but hopefully that'll change soon and we can actually have a real art opening in June or May. I have, um, the creep and bunny show. It's a brother, sister artists that are awesome lowbrow fun stuff and then in june was our biggest art show that we do every year called tiny terrors and this will be tiny terrors for a new hope um <laughs> over 100 artists and probably 300 pieces of art and everything's 10 inches or smaller including the frame so there's a ton of art on these walls that month and i'm hoping by june we can have a real opening and people can come in here because that show you have to see in person because it's fun and tiny yeah, yeah that's I, remember going to, I remember going to that show at the other location yeah yeah tiny it's terror. a fun one it's a pull it off the wall and take it home right then no dots screw that <laughs> all right well thanks again for giving us your time and that concludes this episode of web chat wednesdays